about differences in different aspects, in stereotypical traits, for instance, uh, can affect the fitness of uh, the organism that exists in a, in a locality. Um, sometimes they can be quite complex, especially if the traits are polymorphic, so then different uh, peaks and different valleys can be found. And questions regarding how populations can jump from one to other one and can overpass valleys are quite interesting. Um, Mullerian mimicry is an interaction where um, uh, toxic organisms converge in color pattern. So the idea is that the birds, for example, with, or other uh, visual predators, will learn to associate a warning signal with toxicity. This uh, can promote the convergence among different toxic species that are differently related, and also uh, the monomorphism within the species. This is a positive frequency dependent selection process. So uh, in mimetic communities, um, you can find, for example, different warning signals, and then those warning signals can represent the peaks of the adaptive landscape of mimetic communities. Uh, I work with the butterflies, with Heliconius, and uh, usually you can find a large variety of warning signals within the species. For example, here we can find the distribution of uh, two of these species that are comimic, and we can see how they, they overlap and uh, when they are comimic. The important thing here is that uh, usually in each of those localities, you only find one single signal. However, for my PhD, I am studying uh, another species that apparently is polymorphic within locality. It's called Heliconinomata. And it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> so the idea is that uh, this polymorphism is uh, uh, driven by the mimetism with several species from a distantly related genus that is called Nemea. So here uh, are different species, and here are uh, different morphs of the Heliconinomata species. So in the first part of the talk, I will talk a bit about the origin of those uh, different peaks. So why are the different peaks and not only one? Some authors have proposed that maybe Heliconinomata is not as toxic as the other communities. And then this can promote polymorphism. Let's see why. Let's imagine that all the butterflies in, in a mimetic community are toxic and they have, for example, these two warning signals. And the predators already learned to associate them with toxicity. So then each time they see this warning signal, they will try to avoid it because it's clear that it's toxic. So the fitness of both of those warning signals is going to be high. However, let's say that there is a, a comimic that is not as toxic as the other comimics, and they all uh, imitate only one warning signal. So then the, uh, the link between the warning signal here and the toxicity is not that strong anymore, and maybe the predators will tend to um, feed more on this one because the probability of finding something that is not that toxic is high. So then the, the, the fitness of the, all the, the, in this case, the butterflies that have this warning signal will be uh, lower. So then what happens if this not that toxic species is polymorphic? Then it becomes the advantage of the rare, and then despite it's possible that the fitness of both of the warning signals will be affected, um, it will be just a, a slightly affected or not too much, and then the association will still be present. So the first we still recognize them as a toxic species. So what I wanted to see is if the polymorphism that we have in Heliconis numata is indeed associated with a lower toxicity. So for this reason, we compare a Heliconis numata with other Heliconis species that are monomorphic within locality. And for this, we did experiments with real predators. Unfortunately, not with birds from the tropics, but we used a great teeth. So, um, they, because they are very easy to work with them, because we have the permits, they are naive for the, to those uh, butterflies, they are insectivorous, and they are wild caught. So it's a good proxy. So we compared the consumption of the butterflies and the mealworms, that is one of the favorite foods of the great teeth, especially in winter when they perform the experiments. So what I found was, well, okay, uh, here is going to be the eating weight proportion, so if it's close to zero, 
uh, the item was very disgusting for the predator and they didn't eat it. If it's close to one, they eat, the item was tasty and they ate it. So here is the midpoint proportion, uh, eaten proportion. So it's above 80%. And indeed what I found was that uh, there was no difference in palatability between monomorphic and polymorphic heliconius species. So then that cannot be the one that is promoting the polymorphism uh, within uh, my species. So there are some other theories that we still have to test. So for instance, that the, the fact of being polymorphic is still conferring this advantage on the rare. So maybe there are not that many of these colorful butterflies, but if in the population there are lots of other alternative prey that the birds are used to feed on and they know that they're not toxic, maybe the fact of being rare will confer enough protection to just avoid them. Like the predators will already eat the ones that they know they, they are not. Okay, so now let's uh, move to another uh, uh, part that is this, the persistence of these several peaks in the helicopter map. So first, one of the questions that indeed uh, we should ask is, is true that all are quite similar, all are orange and black and have yellow spots? So maybe all are just tiger pattern and they're recognized as so by the predators, so maybe are all the same. So why to bother and say that they are polymorphic? Maybe they are not. So in this experiment, uh, we, what we were aiming to was to characterize the adaptive landscape by the predator response to warming variation, to the uh, war, to warming pattern variation. So first, to test if indeed there are several peaks and valleys in the in the adaptive landscape, and if, if so, if those peaks are broad or not, and if those valleys are deep or not. So <coughs> the thing is that um, Helicolendumata is distributed in, in a very heterogeneous way. So the morphs that you find in some places are not exactly the same that you find in other places. So and on top, uh, it's very hard to find intermediate morphs. So usually you find uh, these specific and discrete morphs. So taking advantage of that, we simulate, uh, we recreate some butterflies. So we produce uh, dummy butterflies with the uh, wings of paper and bodies of wax. And what we did was to uh, release two local morphs, well, the correspondent to two local uh, butterflies, in five different localities. Additionally, uh, we released the intermediate correspondent to, to them. All of these butterflies were real butterflies that we got from captive breads, and then we photographed, and then we produced the models, we then made them artificially. And so at the end we had five different sets, and on top uh, uh, we had exotic uh, um, butterflies for each of those localities. Um, and well, a uh, cryptic uh, butterfly that we used also as a control. So in general we were expecting to have marks of the visual predators. So for instance, uh, the lunar mammals, lizards, and of course birds, so big marks. So we were releasing the models and we were leaving them for 72 hours and once we picked them, um, these were the kind of, of marks that we found. <coughs> At the end we released about five, more than 5,000 models and we got an attack of circa 5%. <laughs> so wait, what did we find? Here are the numbers of attack per site and here are the, the different uh, morphs. Here are all the localities pulled together. So first we found that indeed the exotic ones were more attacked than the two locals, significantly more attacked. And this is a, a emphasized, like shows how important is the predator pressure in maintaining this heterogeneous special, special distribution of the heliconic butterflies. So to not allow past some morphs that are not present in some localities to others. On top we found that indeed the intermediate morphs were more attacked than the two local morphs. So it's true that there are valleys, it's true that the predators can see the different morphs as such, um, and it's true that there are peaks, of fitness peaks. So uh, this is uh, quite interesting as well, because well, something I haven't told you is that um, there is a very nice genetic architecture that is controlling the color pattern in heliconium butterflies, in, especially in the heliconium numata, 
the color pattern is controlled by a single locus that is locking together the mimetic uh, combination. And on top, there is genetic dominance acting at the local state, at the local range. So it's really preventing the intermediate looking uh, offspring despite it's very easy to find morphs that are different and that can cross because of the same species. So then we can really see how the selection is triggering the evolution of this specific uh, genetical architecture. But on top, we, find, we found that the intermediates were not equally attacking all the, you know, the populations. So here is the rate of attack. And here in this case is how similar is the heterozygote to one of the homozygotes present in the population, the most likely, the, the most, the most uh, similar indeed. So we found a positive correlation showing that the more similar the intermediates were to the, to the local morph, the most, like, the most similar uh, morph, um, the less attack they, they got. So indeed we can maybe represent something like this, that there are the two peaks, and maybe if the intermediate is close enough to the peak, um, it's, it's going to be protected by the signal that is already well established by the, these two peaks. So uh, maybe uh, it can also um, let us infer how possibly a gradual change and uh, small changes can help the populations to uh, get to the top of the peaks and then when they are exploring their adaptive landscape. And on top, we also found that um, in this case, again, the rate of attack, and here is how different were the two locals that I used. So if the two local morphs were very similar, the intermediates were also less attacked than in the other case. So uh, this we can represent more or less like this. If the two local morphs were just too close phenotypically, the fitness valley was not that deep, and maybe then the, the the selection over these uh, intermediates was uh, relaxed. So then it will, it will allow the drift along these two, these two peaks. So this is the, another scenario where uh, these, uh, these butterflies can explore a bit more the adaptive landscape that they are finding in the populations. Thanks a lot for your attention, and do you have any questions? <laughs>
uh, yeah, if it's just because of frequency or it's because of the similarity that they are getting protected or not. <laughs> Great. Well, one last round of applause for Monica.